Welcome to SI Now. It's Wednesday, February 21st. I'm Robin Lundberg, joined by Ryan Aselta. Yeah, Robin, in a new SI investigative report, current and former Dallas Mavericks employees describe a corporate culture rife with misogyny and predatory sexual behavior. Now, the report includes multiple allegations of sexual misconduct against former Mavs president and CEO Terdima Ussery, as well as other cases of alleged misbehavior by members of the organization. I spoke to SI executive editor John Wertheim, who broke this story, for more on what took place with the Dallas Mavericks. One former employee called it a real-life animal house. Can you paint us a picture of exactly what was going on there? Yeah, this, this was a product of a lengthy investigation I undertook with uh, Jessica Luther, who's, who's based in Texas, a great investigative reporter, and we had gotten a tip and pursued it. It was just, you know, Robin, it's just one of these stories where every call led to another, and the, the anecdotes and the corroboration and the stories we were told, the patterns, it really did paint a picture. Uh, I, I think you quoted the, the Animal House line. There were a number of other metaphors. These were mostly former employees, but some current ones as well, mostly female, but some male as well. And, um, you know, it, it, all this, I think, fits into this, this Me Too prism. I mean, I don't know if this story comes about if this were a year ago, but in this climate, I think people felt emboldened to speak, and the, the pattern was pretty clear. Now, you were told the problems extended all the way to HR. What exactly happened when some of these incidents were reported? Yeah, I mean, as you said, it, it did seem like one individual who was a, a, a real culprit was the CEO. So this, this went all the way to the top of the organization. And it also seemed as though HR was problematic, that there, there was an HR official that um, a lot of the women didn't feel like they, they could go to him and talk formally because they, they you know, ha had experiences that suggested he might not be taking them seriously. Now, Ussery was incredibly widely respected in the basketball world. His name was even floated as a possible future NBA commissioner. Does that make you worried or concerned as to how pervasive these type of issues may be across the sports world? Yeah, I, I don't know who knew what, but as you say, I mean, this is a figure who was in his early 30s and commissioner of the CBA. He had a very high-ranking job at Nike. He was the Maverick CEO for, you know, since the late 90s. This is someone that David Stern called a protege at one point. Um, you know, I, again, I, I don't know who knew what, but it did seem like there was a pattern here. This wasn't an isolated incident. Of course, when people think about the Mavericks, they're going to think about Mark Cuban. No one you interviewed for this story said that Mark Cuban was involved or complicit. However, multiple people said they didn't believe that he was unaware, with one saying, of course, Mark knew. Cuban told you he was blindsided by your reporting. Do you believe him? Yeah, I mean, I think this is an obvious direction the story is going to go. This is a very prominent owner. This is a guy who prides himself on, on hands-on approaches and on micromanaging. What did Mark Cuban know? Um, I've spoken with Mark a few times since we went to them uh, with a, a chance to comment. And Mark, as you say, claims to have no knowledge, blindsided. He's been very outspoken. He's embarrassed. He's ashamed. There's been very civil conversations. He's already addressed the, the, the employees of the team. And, you know, I mean, I think that's a valid question. I think it's a reasonable question to wonder what this owner, especially of all owners, um, what, what he did or didn't know. Mark makes a distinction that, look, I'm a basketball guy. You ask me anyone's salary, I know it. You ask me about the basketball analytics, I know it. The business side is something totally separate. I don't even have an office there. These are questions that Mark will have to reckon with. But, uh, again, he's, he's been very upfront and, and got right back to me, and we've had some email exchanges. Um, he's clearly upset by this and uh, you know we'll, we'll see where this goes from here now it was systemic you're, you're implying in the, the reporting they had someone working for Mavs.com who was arrested for uh, assaulting uh, a female and then later uh, also w was in trouble for uh, allegedly hitting a co-worker who he was dating so with all that going on under his purview how much culpability do you think Cuban should have? Yeah, again, I think he, he draws a distinction between the basketball side and the business side. I mean, he's already in the last 24 hours been very proactive. Um, you know, again, I mean, I think these are questions that are going to be continued to be asked of him. Honestly, not, not a good look for an owner who claims, who prides himself. I mean, one of his great calling cards is how much he cares, how passionate he is, how hands-on he is. Um, it's, it's a lot he's got to answer for. To be fair, he did tell you there's a problem in the Mavericks organization. We've got to fix it. That's it. We're going to take every step. It's not something we tolerate. I'm embarrassed, to be honest with you, that it happened under my ownership, and it needs to be fixed, period. End of story. So 
Do you think he's handling it all the right way now? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the genesis of this story came from some reporting on the Panthers and Jerry Richardson. I never spoke to Jerry Richardson. Um, Jerry Richardson, I don't believe, has made a public statement since the allegations came out. I mean, obviously, Mark isn't the subject of the allegations per se, but still, this is the organization that he runs. You know, the buck stops here. Um, and Mark, in the last 24 hours alone, has been very outspoken. And again, it's some, some action to go with the words as well. Speaking of the Jerry Richardson story, you broke that a couple months ago. How does this story compare? It's different in the sense that this was the owner committing bad acts in Carolina. In this case, in, in Dallas, Mark Cuban, let's, let's be clear, a lot of people wonder, you know, Mark had to have known, but the acts themselves are not attributed to Mark Cuban. Again, the response has been very different. Um, you know, the, the Panthers were not particularly forthcoming, and within an hour of sending Mark Cuban some questions and assertions, we're spending some, some time on the phone and have had multiple communications since. Um, you know, I, again, these are, these are patterns, these are cultures. One thing I, I took away from both stories is that this has the effect of chasing women out of the sports industry. And in both situations, both in Charlotte and in Dallas, there are women who worked in sports and got out of the industry because they did not feel respected, they did not feel safe. And I think that's one takeaway from this story, that they're bad actors and that they are Me Too allegations. But one of the effects of this is that in an industry that's already disproportionately male, Cultures like this have the impact of driving away women, and that's, that's a problem. When you, you talk about the sports culture, I, I think it's worth noting the term locker room culture was used to describe the environment in Dallas, yet no players were implicated. In fact, it, you made it clear that the locker room itself was an actual refuge from, from all of this. So how much do you think is corporate culture, and how much do you think is, is the sports yeah, corporate culture? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's an irony. We hear this term locker room culture, and yet we had women say, I go to the locker room and... Dirk Nowitzki, great guy. Vince Carter, great. Coach Carlisle, nothing but respectful. They'd go to the office, and that's where the, the locker room culture would, would kick in. So, um, I mean, this, this is one of the rare sports stories where, where the athletes themselves have, have nothing to do with some of the allegations being lodged. Let's, let's be clear about that. But, you know, these are predominantly male workforces and workplaces, and it's, it's a, the sports industry. And, again, I mean, some of the behavior, this is not one guy. This is not one bad apple. I mean, this is a story about a culture. John Wertham, we appreciate your incredible reporting on this. Thanks, Robin. All right, with more on the legal ramification behind the accusations in this story, we welcome in SI's legal analyst, Michael McCann. And Michael, the story consists of complaints about a workplace environment, but there are no allegations that entered the legal realm. What would need to happen for this to become a legal matter? Well, Ryan, it could become a legal matter if the NBA launches an investigation under the league constitution. And the league has the authority to conduct investigations. Also, Commissioner Silver, under the best interest of the game clause, has the ability to punish the Mavericks or Mark Cuban or others in all sorts of ways, including suspensions, fines, and even forfeiture of draft picks. And the reason it could become a legal matter is that the Mavericks might oppose that. The Mavericks might say, look, this is our internal business affairs. We may have problems running our business, but this is fundamentally our business. I don't think that's going to happen, but that is one way it could become a legal controversy. And secondarily, although some of the alleged victims have signed non-disclosure agreements, uh, they could potentially consider litigation against the Mavericks, although that seems unlikely at this point if they've signed uh, contracts upon exiting the company. Michael, Mavericks owner Mark Cuban made a statement that he was unaware of the misconduct going on within his organization. Can Cuban be found liable of any wrongdoing if he actually knew nothing? Yeah, he could be, even, even then, Robin, because the league constitution makes clear that any conduct detrimental to the league, and Adam Silver could interpret that as omissions, that omissions that are wrongful, that an owner of a team ought to have adequate supervision over what takes place in the team. And certainly, Mark Cuban is considered a hands-on owner. If there's any owner that one would think would have a sense of what's happening in his franchise, it would be Mark Cuban. So Adam Silver could say that it betrays the mission of the NBA to promote gender equality, to promote a safe workplace for everyone who works for an NBA team when one ownership group is apparently not paying attention to what's taking place in terms of the front office. 
Now, Michael, we've seen former Clippers owner Donald Sterling lose his NBA team, and Jerry Richardson recently put the Panthers up for sale following allegations of misconduct. During the Sterling scandal, Cuban said that forcing the Clippers owner to sell could lead to a slippery slope. Is there a scenario here where Cuban might actually have to give up the Mavericks? I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, for one, I mean, even Cuban's comment was in a different context. It was the context of him saying he disagrees with the idea that an owner could be thrown out for comments made in private, albeit very racist comments made in private. So he opposed it on, I think, a more narrow grounds than the situation that he's encountered here. Uh, but besides that, I, I'm just very skeptical that three quarters of owners would vote out an owner uh, unless the conduct was truly egregious, such as committing a criminal act. Here it looks like he was maybe negligent, that he didn't adequately supervise his team. You know, I could see other owners saying, wow, if I vote him out, what, what's been taking place on my team, right? I mean, may, maybe other ownership groups have had sexual harassment, sexual misconduct issues. Many of them are resolved privately without the media finding out. So I, I'm very skeptical that owners would vote him out for this. Now, the NBA released a statement saying this alleged conduct runs counter to the steadfast commitment of the NBA and its teams to foster safe, respectful, and welcoming workplaces for all employees. And they said they will closely monitor the team's independent investigation. How responsible is the NBA for the workplace culture of individual teams? Yeah, it's interesting because the NBA is really a separate entity from the teams themselves. The NBA is an entity that, of course, governs a league office and has offices in other parts of the world. It employs people directly for the NBA, but teams themselves are part of a joint venture. They're independently owned entities and employees of those teams work for teams. They don't work for the NBA. Now, the NBA oversees these entities, but this is kind of a unique character of pro sports league. It, it isn't like you know owning one fast food chain, owning one franchise in a fast food chain. Here, these are really unique entities that are together through the joint venture. So it's not really settled as to what oversight the NBA has over individual franchises. Teams are obligated to follow league rules. But in terms of individuals who work for teams, their employer is the teams and not the NBA. Michael, the report also talked about a former Mavs.com employee, Earl Sneed, who remained employed by the team despite being arrested for violence against a woman. It also states that Sneed allegedly struck a co-worker he was dating. Now, Sneed was fired following the SI report and released a statement saying, quote, I also signed a contract stating that I would not have one-on-one -on -one contact or fraternize with female employees after the inaccurately described incident with a female co-worker who was also a live-in girlfriend. Now, if this timeline of events is correct here, Michael, the Mavericks knew of the incident between the two co-workers and continue to employ Snead. Does this and the contract he apparently signed make things worse for the Mavs? Yeah, I mean, I mean, why would they continue to employ him? I mean, I think that's just, it's just a bizarre issue. There are so many people that are qualified for that kind of position. So many people, frankly, looking for that kind of job to think that they would continue to employ someone, uh, even if he's the greatest at this job. And I don't know if that's ever been established. Uh, why? I mean, it, it certainly seems like the team is cutting someone a break who's already shown himself to engage in very, very worrisome conduct. And again, this gets back to Mark Cuban, because how could Mark Cuban really not know about any of this? I mean, it just I, I guess it's possible he could be he could be overlooking what's taking place. But uh, it, it certainly makes the Mavericks look bad. I mean, they didn't have to fire him, to be clear. They're not legally obligated to. It, it just seems very odd that the team would continue to employ someone in a position where there's so much demand for that kind of job. It's really a head scratcher. Yeah, the report is very in-depth. Michael McCann, as always, thanks for your insight. Thank you. In a Sports Illustrated investigation, multiple current and ex-Dallas Mavericks employees accused former president and CEO, Terdima Usri, of sexual misconduct. But who is Usri? A graduate of Princeton with advanced degrees from Harvard and Cal Berkeley, Usri became a rising star in the sports world in the early 1990s. He served as commissioner of the Continental Basketball Association and president of Nike Sports Management. In 1993, SI published a profile of Usri titled, In a League of His Own, 
and in 1997, he became the CEO of the Mavs. He was even considered a potential future NBA commissioner. But just a year into his tenure in Dallas, the team conducted an internal investigation after several female employees complained of inappropriate behavior. The Mavericks retained Ussery, but rewrote the employee handbook to include a sexual harassment policy. Mark Cuban bought the Mavs in 2000, and 15 years later, Ussery left the team, with Cuban's blessing, for a role at Under Armour. Less than two months later, after a female coworker told HR about an alleged inappropriate incident, Ussery resigned. Ussery denies the details of SI's report. All right, to college basketball now, where on Tuesday the NCAA denied an appeal from the University of Louisville, ruling that the men's basketball team must vacate its 2013 national championship over Michigan. Now, the ruling stems from an investigation that alleges that a former basketball staff member arranged sex parties for players and recruits between 2010 and 2015. Louisville becomes the first program in the Final Four era to vacate a national title. Members of the Louisville National Championship team reacted on Tuesday with Kevin Ware tweeting, still got this fat ass ring, which means my guys definitely want a chip, if I'm not mistaken, of course, while Luke Hancock said, quote, I don't care that much about the perception and I don't think it changes that much. We won those games. It's not like that never happened. Disappointing, yes, but they can't take away the experience and they can't look at it as if it never happened because we won those games. So does vacating previous titles as punishment even matter, Ryan? Yeah, Robin, I go back and forth. It does ring hollow. I mean, let's face it. We saw Louisville beat Wichita State in the Final Four and beat Michigan in the national championship. You, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, so to speak, there. So it, it happened, and the players allude to that. But uh, it does affect the fan base, the Louisville fan base, to see that banner come down. It affects the university, the community. But uh, as a whole, in college basketball, I don't think it has a huge effect on them. And does the punishment fit the crime here? Um, I don't know how those sex parties really affected that national championship team, whether it maybe recruiting, we're saying here. Well, Get in line with that. We're going to hear a lot more about that with the FBI investigation that continues to develop, uh, which could take down the entire structure of college basketball. Yeah, I guess if you're the most ardent Louisville supporter or, or a team that has the championship vacated, there's a sense of pride that could be hit. But overall, it's relatively meaningless because, like Hancock said, we all know who won the championship in a given year. I don't think when we go back and we recall specific years, even in vacated years, we say, oh, yeah, but that title was vacated. We right. say, no, they won the national championship that year because those were the teams that played and one team emerged victorious in that particular game. So overall, it, it feels kind of, you use the word hollow. That, that's a yeah. good word. How about a message here? Is a message sent uh, by the NCAA to... to so teams, universities, programs around the country with this? It's tough because the NCAA as a whole, it's very difficult for some people to see them as the arbiter of these things because yeah. there's a, a lot of you know, controversy about the way they run things and their methods and, and possible corruption there. So sometimes when that is the, the body that is governing these sort of punishments, it's very difficult for people to take them at face value. Yeah, I think the message is sent when people lose jobs, when a face like Rick Pitino loses his job. Now, he lost his job uh, following the FBI investigation, but that sends a message. Ineligibility, instant ineligibility, sends a message because it affects the team instantly. Years later, I don't know if the message is sent. We talk about Patino. Coaches around the country have also reacted to the news yesterday. As are people on, on Facebook. Yeah. Jared Melcher on Facebook says, so does that mean Michigan wins? I guess that's another way to spin it, right? If you're actually vacating the championship. Right, and, and John Beeline, Michigan's head coach, said he's not going to take that title of national championship. People want to give it to him, fine, but he's not going to go around thinking he's a national championship. And speaking of the coaches, Wichita State head coach Greg Marshall, whose Shockers lost to Louisville in the Final Four, well, he kind of joked a little bit about it. Uh, talking about losing to Louisville and maybe even squaring off against Michigan. Take a look. I was with Coach Beeline in Maui, and, and he and I had a conversation, and, and I jokingly brought up the fact that we should maybe play a game and, and, and dub it the 2013 national title game. And he laughed and, and just, you know, I don't, I don't want to speak for him, but I think he had some of the same sentiments about the whole situation as I do. Robin, clearly Marshall joking, but it stings. I mean, he lost to that team that is basically ruled ineligible, but you can't go back in time, like we've said. Uh, Penalty-wise, 
Is there a better penalty that would work in a case like this? I'm sure if we really thought about it, there's a better penalty. But I, I feel like we spend too much time focusing on the penalty. I, I don't believe that these teams shouldn't be penalized. But you have to work on, on the root problems. Why are these things happening? Why are, are people skirting the rules? Are the rules that are in place the correct rules? I, I, I think treating the symptoms without treating the root cause is ultimately problematic. Yeah, it, most of the NCAA sanctions affect the student body after the fact, which isn't really fair. It's not fair to the current players at Louisville. It's not fair to the, the student body, the fans, even the administration that may not have been there at the time. The only way you hit home, though, with this universities is with money, fines. And I'm not talking about the, the $1 million fine that Louisville might pay here. It's got to be substantial. That will hit home when you come down to money with the university, losing millions and millions of dollars. I think the universities will then take a more active role in overseeing all of these programs that are all under their watch. And we're going to learn a lot more about this with this FBI investigation that continues to develop. And really, it could take down what we know is college basketball right now. And I think part of the context to that discussion when you're bringing up money will come back to whether the athletes should be paid, which, of course, is an ongoing conversation when it comes to college basketball. It's day 13 at the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. Here's who won, what made news, and which events you should watch. Lindsey Vaughn won the bronze medal in what was likely the final downhill ski event of her Olympic career. Her rival and friend Sophia Goja took gold. Keegan Randall and Jesse Diggins made history, winning the cross-country ski team sprint for USA. This is the first American medal in cross-country skiing since 1976, one of the country's longest medal droughts. In women's singles figure skating, the American women each failed to skate a clean short program and now face an uphill battle going into the free skate program. The Olympic athletes from Russia are expected to take gold and silver. The men's hockey team was eliminated by the Czech Republic yesterday. The game went to overtime and was ultimately decided 1-0 in a shootout. Tonight, Lindsey Vaughn and Michaela Schifrin compete in their final event of the Olympics, the Alpine Combined. The men's freestyle ski halfpipe features four Americans, including Sochi gold medalist David Wise and current frontrunner Aaron Blunk. And the USA takes on rival Canada in women's hockey for a gold medal rematch. In Sochi, the Americans squandered a 2-0 lead and lost in overtime. Olympic gold medalist and figure skating Hall of Famer Christy Yamaguchi joins us today on behalf of Milk Life Campaign and Team Milk. Christy, your new campaign recreates some iconic photos from 1995. And if you look at these photos side by side, what, what goes through your head with the familiarity here? Oh, yeah, it's fun being part of that Milk Mustache campaign a little over 20 years ago now and then uh, coming full circle with uh, Milk Life once again and, and Team Milk. It's uh, gearing up for the Olympics and a lot of excitement uh, and some great U.S. athletes who are also part of Team Milk. So it's nice to stay involved. And Milk has been an important role in your life as an athlete and a mother. Talk about that a little bit. Um, absolutely. I mean, we know that 9 out of 10 U.S. Olympians and Paralympians grew up drinking milk. I was definitely one of those. My parents had milk on the table every night at dinner and for breakfast. And, you know, to this day, I still have it with my oatmeal or in a smoothie. And being a mom now, uh, my two daughters have their activities and are pretty busy. So make sure milk's on the table for them and you know it's a great way to start their day to fuel them for whatever their activities are. Now from a young girl with club feet to a figure skating <laughs> hall of famer how did you know you had something special there with skating? I just loved it you know it was just there was something magical about skating and even though it was hard at the beginning and maybe I didn't progress as naturally as quickly as some of the others I just kept at it and I, I just really loved it so um, you know, it's probably good uh, coordination and strengthening for, uh, for my legs, but then um, I think it was also just an outlet for a young, shy girl. Was there a pivotal moment or a memory that you have that you're like, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize I was that good at this? Probably when I was maybe around 15, 16, and I started to compete internationally. and was doing pretty well internationally at that point. I won um, a junior world championships when I was 16. So um, at that point, I was like, OK, I'm all in, and let's see where this goes. And it's, it's pretty fun <laughs> as well, right? Yeah, very fun. I mean, skating, there's just so many elements to it that I love, the expression with music and learning new jumps and, and uh, just keeping up with the competition. But um, 
this is very expressive sport, so uh, that, yeah, I loved it. And talking about the expressive sport, you've seen the evolution of where the sport's gone. Some figure skaters are going, you know, a little bit more creative or different with their music styles. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking of, of the figure skaters today? I think it's great. I mean, it's you want to see the sport progress and improve and evolve. And I think with the um, the music allowing vocals now, that kind of adds another layer. Uh, and not everyone is going to use vocals, but it's kind of nice and refreshing to see it here and there, um, especially if the skaters are able to really um, interpret the music um, nicely. Now, the Olympics are coming up. As a gold medalist yourself, what's your most memorable Olympic moment? Ooh, um, I mean, aside the podium moment where I received the gold medal, that was pretty special in, in sitting there while the, or standing there while the national anthem gets played, but also uh, the opening ceremonies. And it's, um, it's a dream, right, just to become an Olympian and to say, oh, I'm going to march in with the entire team with bobsledders and skiers and speed skaters and figure skaters, and then all of a sudden you're announced as the U.S. Olympic team. And uh, it's a pretty proud and, and patriotic moment. Now, representing your country on this stage is obviously a tremendous honor. And, you know, in the political climate today, it's become a source of some debate. I'm not going to press you on that road with this, but you have an interesting story. I understand both your mother and your father uh, were in Japanese-American internment camps during World War II, as well as your mm -hmm. grandparents. Did that impact your perception of representing the United States on a grand stage? Uh, n not me personally, just because I was a teenager and I was just kind of pursuing what I love to do. But, um, you know, I think after I won and seeing the support I received from the Japanese and, and the Asian community, Asian American community in general, uh, it was a uh, pretty eye opening and um, interesting. And I think at that point I started to look back and look at the history of my family and what it's been through and knowing that I'm really only one generation off of um, the family who lost everything. So, um, you know, I knew that my uh, ancestors and, and the generations before me really paved the way for me to live the American dream. Now, ICE is a prominent place in your family. Uh -huh. Your husband, Brett, is a retired professional hockey player. Mm -hmm. Do your two daughters have the same interest in, in skating or hockey? Um, one of our daughters does. We have a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old. So the 12-year-old, Emma, she does skate, and she's been skating for almost seven, about seven years now. So she's competing locally and kind of at a lower level, but she's enjoying it and learning some great life lessons. And Does she have your talent? Yeah. She actually does pretty well, but, you know, I don't know if the passion is there. You know, it's that that's the thing, and that's what's going to separate. So I'm encouraging it, but I'm not pushing it because I think that has to come within her. Now, the Olympics coming up again. Who are you most excited to watch in this upcoming Games? Ooh. You know, in figure skating, um, our whole U.S. team for figure skating, I'm excited. I, they all work so hard, and I've seen them you know, through the years preparing for this moment. Um, Mariah Nagasu seeing, seeing her come back and being back at the Olympics and trying the, a triple axel, which um, she may be the only one attempting it in the women's competition. Um, and Karen Chen in the figure skating, who's uh, from my hometown of Fremont. So we, we share a little kinship there. Oh, wow. Well, this will be a very <laughs> exciting Olympics. Christy, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you.